Good morning to you as well. We're glad you're here. Um, and online, we are glad you are with us as well. So we're in the, towards the end of this series. We have a few more weeks left in the book of Galatians, and we're going to be in chapter 5 in a few moments. But if we um, are kind of tracking through this series, one of the things that's been really important, I think that Paul wants these Christians to understand is that the promise came first, right? So there was the promise that God gave to Abraham, and that came 430 years before he gave the law to Moses. And just because he gave the law does not mean that the promise to Abraham does not matter. It is still a part of their life, and it is still the foundation of everything they know. Because the purpose of the promise was to save the people. But the purpose of the law was to form the people. And they wanted the law to be their Savior. But as we've kind of talked about the last several weeks, laws make terrible saviors. Because a law cannot save you. The only thing a law can do is reveal your ability or inability to obey it. And so what these Christians were trying to convey, what these Jewish Christians were trying to convey was that faith in Christ plus the law equaled new life in Christ. It's great that you have faith in Christ, but you can't get rid of the law. You can't be a Christian. You can't be a child of Abraham if you haven't been circumcised, if you're not obeying all of it. But Paul's message is simply faith in Christ equals new life in Christ. Faith in Christ equals new life in Christ. And that faith, as we defined in chapter 3, was this belief that Jesus is Lord, that He is Messiah, and that we are baptized into Him. And that we live our life as if we believe that promise is true. That we are joined. And so last week we looked at a really kind of different passage where it's talking about Sarah and Hagar. And in this picture that he gives us, this allegory, the slave woman is Hagar who gives birth to a son named Ishmael. And the free woman is Sarah, who gives birth to Isaac. And his big point in all of this, in this connection, was that you need to under... Go, go back. There we go. That the slave woman gave birth to Ishmael. And Abraham asks God to bless his son Ishmael. And God's response is, no, I can't do that. And it's not because I don't like your son Ishmael. But I can't bless him because Ishmael was your plan. Ishmael was you saying, God, I don't see how this is possible. I don't see how I'm 100 and my wife's 90. I don't see how this could happen. And since you promised it would, and we don't understand how it could, we're going to make sure it happens the way you thought it should. No, I'm not going to bless your plan, Abraham. I'm going to bless my plan. I'm going to bless my plan that you didn't understand. I'm going to bless my plan that you couldn't comprehend. I'm going to bless my plan that you couldn't see. And through that blessing, the world is going to receive my blessing. And what we said is the problem is we see impossibility where God sees endless possibility. And it scares us away from choosing faith. And that word faith is so central to this letter. This word faith is so central to this letter. 
that we would believe and that we would trust in the saving power of Jesus Christ alone to save us. And so that, that's Paul is kind of taking us to this point. You have to choose. You can have the promise of God or you can have the law. You can stand under Christ's righteousness or you can stand on your own righteousness. But you cannot do both. And so I want to jump into chapter 5. But as we do that, I want to jump to the end of this section in chapter 5. So verse um, 7. There we go. And, and just before we get into this, sorry, go back to space. Sorry, I'm sorry, Stephen. I've had. Um, anyone like a channel flipper? Any husbands? Channel flippers? Wives, raise your hand if your husband is a channel flipper. Okay, there we go. Streaming has kind of messed that up. We can't flip channels quite as easily for, for most of us. But have you ever been um, sitting there, especially wives, where your husband is going like football game, cooking show, crime drama, football game, news show, and it's just on and on, and your brain's like just jumping from point to point to point? Right, so that's what this section is for Paul. Okay? This, this little section right here is, is Paul jumping. Okay? So, verse 7. You were running a good race. Right? So we, we're running a race, we're on a track. Who cut you off from keeping or to keep you from obeying the truth? So you're running this race, someone cut in on you. Right? Verse 8. What kind of persuasion? does not come from the one who calls you. So now it's like a courtroom, almost, who's persuading you. Verse 9, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Now we're on to cooking. Then verse 10, I'm confident with, um, in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, We'll have to pay the penalty back to a courtroom. Then he goes to his personal life. Verse 11. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross, and we're going to spend a good bit of time the rest of the message on what that really is. The offense of the cross has been abolished. This offense of the cross has been gotten rid of. As, verse 12, as for those agitators, that's what he calls these people who are coming in and basically saying, now it's not just faith in her. You can't just ditch the law. You can't just say circumcision no longer matters. These agitators, they're stirring people up. They're teaching things that, that aren't true. These agitators, I wish they would go ahead go the whole way and emasculate themselves. So their big thing is, right, circumcision. You have to be circumcised. And Paul is just like, just get rid of all of it. Like, that doesn't matter. It's not important. The law that you think is so important, the law that you think is saving you, is what he's referring to when he talks about the offense of the cross. Which seems kind of a strange connection, right? How, how could obedience to the law be about a curse? Could it, how could it be about this offense of the cross? And in this little section, his big point that he wants you to walk away from right, is hold on. Hold on. Don't let go. Don't give in. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Don't compromise. But that offense of the cross, 
is kind of laid out in the first part of this section. So jumping to verse 1 and back to the beginning of chapter 5. It is for freedom, um, the word freedom, um, el euthreia, euthreia, excuse me, um, and it means personal freedom, right, from servitude, confinement, and oppression. It is for freedom, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So he uses it the first time as a noun, the second time as a verb. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What is the yoke of slavery? The yoke of slavery is the law. right? Their connection to the law, their obedience to the law is what he refers to as a yoke of slavery. And it, it brings up some really, really important questions. And we've tried to kind of address some bigger theological questions through this series. And I think this is a really important one. Is the gospel a free ticket to do anything we want? Right? It's for freedom that Christ has set you free, so stand firm. Don't submit to a yoke of slavery. You don't have to obey the law. So, is the gospel a free ticket to do anything we want? We're not judged by it. Can we just do whatever? It doesn't matter. But it goes back to the purpose of the law. They wanted to use the law as a way to show how righteous they were. Right? I showed you my scorecard. Guessing yours is similar. They wanted the law to show how righteous they were. But laws cannot do that. Right? Laws only reveal our ability to obey or disobey. That's all laws can do. And so he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set me free. Can we do anything we want? Does it matter? Right? But the purpose of the law was not to save the people. The law makes a terrible Savior. The purpose of the law was to form the people. Right? If you will obey my commands, then you will be my people. That was the purpose. So that he could form them to be his people. To be his priest and to represent him in this world. Right? God's great hope for the world is you and me. That they would see Christ in us. That was plan A. I'm going to form a people who look like me and who represent me and I'm going to send them out into the world. That's plan A. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. And so can we do anything we want? No! Right? Do we go on sinning so that grace... No! But the motive behind it, the reason we do it, is not so that we will be saved. The motive behind it is that we are loving the world as Christ first loved us. And motives matter. Why you do, what you do matters. And so then he goes on, verse 2, 
And he says this, mark my words. Any parents ever say that? My mom used to say that all the time to me. Mark my words. When I get home, that room better be clean. And what did that mean? Like, if I didn't have that room clean, when she walked in the door, I was in trouble. Because she would say, wait till your father gets home. (laughs) Just wait. Just wait. Mark my words. And so Paul is emphasizing this, this emphatic statement. Mark my words. Okay? Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, now this is, this is a really crazy statement. This, this is tough. Okay? Christ will be of no value to you at all. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds, that sounds a little over the top. But it goes back to motives. Right, it goes back to the purpose. Why were they saying they needed to be circumcised? They were saying they needed to do that so that they could be a child of Abraham. But Paul's point is, you don't need that to be a child of Abraham. You have that faith You have that heritage because of your faith in Christ. Because of that, you are a child of Abraham. And Paul keeps talking about how he sees them as his children. And so our our hope in this, right? I I tell you that... No, go back. Sorry. Sorry. I tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, if if you're going to follow the law, then Christ will be of no value to you at all. It's not that circumcision was bad. It's not that you should not do that if that's what you feel you need to do. Because there are some things that just help our conscience, I think. But his point is, if you think that will save you, and trust me, we can fill in the blank, because that might be different for us today. But if you think that will save you, and you're going to pursue that then Christ has no value to you at all. And what Paul is praying for is that Christ would be formed in these people. In verse 3, Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Right, if you're going to follow part of it, and let that declare you as righteous, then you have to follow all of it. Not just the laws on circumcision. Not just the Ten Commandments. All 613 of them. And we saw how how bad we do with the the first ten, right? All 613, you have to obey them. So you choose. Do you want to be justified, and that's the word he's going to use in verse 4, you who are trying to be justified, and it means, justified means to be declared righteous, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. I grew up thinking that there was only one way to fall away from grace. And that was through sin. But grace means, it's charis in the Greek, it means unmerited favor. 
but to fall away from grace meant we were disobedient. It means you continually transgress. We continually sidestep time and time again. And the fear is we would fall away from grace. Go back to verse 4 for me. And that if we did that, we were alienated from Christ. And here's my guess. There's a lot of people in this room who have felt time and time again that they have fallen away from grace. Because you, just like the people of Israel, have made those commitments. This time is going to be different. This time I'm not going back. This time I'm not going to stumble. This time I'm not going to fall. This time I'm not going to fail. My resolve is great. God, I'm with you. And yet time and time again, we fall. And we find ourselves questioning where we stand with Christ. See, my guess is there's a lot of people in the room this morning who are wondering if you've done enough. If you've been good enough. If you've been obedient enough. If you've loved and showed grace enough to erase what you have done. But that is not how Paul says they fell from grace. It was in trying to use the law to declare them righteous. When the law actually did the opposite. It declared them unrighteous. And his point throughout this letter is you can stand on the grace of Christ or you can stand on your own righteousness. You can stand on Christ's righteousness or you can stand on your own ability to obey the law. You get to choose, but you don't get both. And it brings up another really, really big, important theological question for us. Can you fall from grace because of sin? Is it it possible to fall from the grace of God because of our sin? And so I want to kind of three different ways to, to look at that question and answer that question. One, that question is above my pay grade and it is above yours. We do not get to make that decision. Thankfully, that does not fall on you and I. Okay? That's one. Second, what is it that you are pursuing? Because I think there are so many times when we ask that question, we're asking it because we're not trying to pursue Christ. We're really asking the question, how far can I move away from Christ and still be accepted? Which direction are you moving? Because there is an entire different mindset of I'm going this direction and I'm sidestepping and I'm doing what I want because I want to. And God, I'm chasing after you, but I keep falling. 
Right? Those are different directions. Those are different pursuits. I, I would say the, se- the first one is not really falling from grace. It's choosing something other than grace. And the other part of this question we ask is people will respond, well, how can a God who loves His creation turn His back on His creation? But I think what we miss in that, definitely not on that, what we miss in that is it's not God turning His back on His people. It's His people turning their back on Him. So what is it that you're pursuing? Can you fall from grace because of sin? I would say if you're pursuing Christ with all of your heart and continuing to stumble, then no. The grace of God covers you. But if you're choosing something else other than Christ... then I think you're not falling from grace. You're walking away from it. See, and that's a really important question. Can we fall from grace because of sin? Because if that's true, if we can't, if the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us, All of us in this room who are wholeheartedly trying to pursue Christ, who mess up and who stumble and fall, Paul would say, found freedom in Christ. That you don't have to get it right all the time because you can't. And there's freedom. In knowing that. There is freedom in knowing this does not depend on you. It's not yours to win because Christ already won. So he says this in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. This circumcision does not make you Jewish. This uncircumcision does not make you a non-Jew. It does not make you a child of Abraham. Christ does. Christ does. Choose Jesus. And so i got to confess something this week. This last week or two was kind of a light bulb moment for me in this book. Because as I have been reading Galatians, I have been so incredibly judgmental. Not, Not judgmental of you but judgmental of those that Paul is calling the agitators. Because they are insisting that what they grew up with was still essential to their faith. Because from the time they were born, they were told that Torah is life. The first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that is life. And that is the law, and that is how we live, and that is how we have a right relationship with God, and we cannot alienate that. Because that is who we are. 
And I've been so judgmental because Paul comes up to them and says, hey, I know this is what you've believed your whole life. But I had this experience where I met Jesus, and He showed me that all of the law is worthless in our relationship with Him. Now, put yourself in the shoes of those Jewish Christians. Something that you've believed your entire life. And someone comes up to you and says, you know what? That's useless. You don't need it. That is not what, it's not that it's not important, but it's not doing what you thought it was doing. Could you imagine how you would react? Could you imagine? I would be really, really hard pressed to not just turn my head and walk away. To say, you have no clue what you're talking about. This has been my life. In the Talmud, which is written about two or three centuries after Jesus, go to that next, concerning that same issue, and the same issue that he's talking about in this section is how we teach children. Okay? Issue, uh, Rabbi Samuel Bar Shilat, a teacher of children, do not accept a student before the age of six, as he is too young. And if it is difficult for him to learn in a steady manner, from this point forward, from the age of six forward, accept him as a student and stuff him with Torah like an ox. So from the age of six, you've been told this is life. This is everything. This is how you relate to God. And someone comes into your life and says, all that was so important, Christ is all that matters now. How difficult is it? How difficult is it to let go of something you have been told, taught, and held on to your entire life? And I found myself being so judgmental of these people who have been told, taught, and held on to this their entire life. That they couldn't let go. It was ingrained in them. But if the law is your Savior, then obedience becomes a burden. If the law is your Savior, obedience becomes a burden. Hey, Will, could I borrow you for a minute? Do you mind? Can I use your muscles? You just stand right here. I'm going to give you a handle to hold on to. Okay? You good? Yeah. So, so we have in our mind these things that we're supposed to obey. Don't commit adultery. Honor God with your life. And, and you think, like, some of those, like, not, not super hard, right? And no other gods before you. And don't murder. Like, we're pretty good at those, right? We, we can cover some of those. But over time, as we start to carry more and more, because the problem is we don't just carry the law. We carry our failure to obey the law. And sometimes that weight far outweighs 
what we feel in the law. Because that weight has a past. But the problem is it doesn't just stop with our ability to obey. It also continues on with how we see other people seeing us. Do they feel like we stand up to the weight? Do they feel like we're good enough? How do I look before them? And if that's not enough to mess with our minds, then we add to it the weight of comparing ourselves to other people. I'll just... How's that, how's that feeling? It's heavy. It's, it's heavy. It's 80 pounds right now. See, now, now here's the thing. I, I picked someone with big biceps. And I'll, I'll just be honest, like this sermon's going to last as long as your hand does. No. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make the point. We can stand here long enough that that weight's going to get pretty heavy. It's already probably getting there. It's hurting. All right, you can set it down. You made it a lot longer than a lot of other people would have. Thanks, man. But see, here's the thing. The, The problem is the weight we carry is not just in our ability to obey. The weight we carry is how you see my ability to obey. And where I feel I compare to you and your ability to obey. And let's just be honest. That weight that weight gets really, really heavy. My guess is there are some people who have been carrying that weight their whole life. Trying to be good enough to stand before Christ. Trying your best And one of the greatest temptations I think we ever face is the temptation to focus more on the outside than the inside. Instead of trusting the one who took that weight on our behalf so that we would no longer have to carry it. So he says this in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Carry it, carry it, carry it. But set it down. Because as much as you want to carry it, and tough it out, and hold on to it, it means nothing. The only thing that matters is faith being expressed through love. That we would live our life like we believe this message is true. That Christ has taken the weight of our sin off of our backs and placed it on His. The only thing that counts. Now go live in a way that honors Christ. And so the law no longer becomes the measure of our life. But Jesus is the measure of our life. Father, we thank You so much for this day. God, we're grateful for the fact that You took the weight of our sins. And you place them upon your shoulders. 
And Father, you bore the weight that we could not bear. We thank you, Father, for the gift of that love. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. And we are grateful for all that you have done and continue to do to cleanse us and to call us righteous children of God. Not because of ourselves, not because of our works, that we would boast. But all of this is a gift from God. Father, we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.